everybody. I am here with a good friend of mine. We've collaborated on papers. We've got things in the works. Uh, but I'm here today with Brenda Rowe, and we're going to talk about oh, a classic one. It's an old one, but a good one. Um, so Brenda, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Okay, sure. So uh, I'm Brenda Rowe. I work at Texas A&M University San Antonio as a professor of criminology and criminal justice. And uh, my research area is legal issues in criminal justice. And that is super interesting based on your background. <laughs> oh, sure. So I guess I, I left out a little bit. I'm actually also an attorney, uh, licensed in Texas, and I used to be a prosecutor uh, in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Okay, so that's interesting. You're bringing a, an interesting perspective to this because uh, the JD PhD is pretty rare. <laughs> yeah, it, it is. It's fairly rare, although I, I know a few of us because we all tend to band together and <laughs> we end up doing the same conference panels and research together. And judging just us lowly PhDs. <laughs> no, 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 not at all. Um, okay, so I'm sure it's pretty obvious to folks, but uh, why would you pick Law & Order? Well, first of all, a wildly popular series that went on for many years, so a lot of people would be familiar with this. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's where a lot of people, including college students, get their ideas of what's going on in a courtroom. Unfortunately, it's just not that realistic. If only it were this interesting. I mean, you know, sure, that'd be great if my time in the courtroom was like this, but it's, it's totally not. <laughs> yeah, I think anybody who's had jury duty can attest to the fact that it is not this interesting. No, no, more like watching paint dry. <laughs> it really is. And that's, that's a disappointment, right? But I think that the same goes with like policing dramas, right? That students think they're going to go and kick doors in all day long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in fact, one of the things I do in my classes is I have students go conduct a court observation in the courtroom and write about it. And their essays are always really interesting because they automatically talk about how it's nothing like what they thought it'd be from things like Law and Order and uh, talk about uh, just how much sitting around there was and mm -hmm. how there wasn't like media and the courtroom wasn't packed full of people. It's, it's, Nobody gasping, like just collecting no, gasps in the courtroom. No. You know, big, no big outbursts in the courtroom, no, none of that. Uh, so you're going to burst all of our bubbles today, and I'm okay with that. Unfortunately, yes. Okay. I do it with criminal <laughs> minds. You can do it with law and order. It, it happens. <laughs> all right. So we'll go ahead and watch this first clip, uh, and you can tell us what you think. Okay, great. The iconic gavel. Okay. So, I mean, Carisi was one of my favorite prosecutors on this show. He was. Yes. He was great. The former police officer turned prosecutor, right? It was interesting, yeah. And actually, I worked with a prosecutor who was a former police officer. Really? Yeah. So that does happen, actually. Okay. So, I mean, this is interesting. Let, let's stop for a second right here. So, <laughs> I'll just say already that Carisi immediately gets up prosecutor gets up and walks towards the witness. That's, that's not how it works. You have to ask permission to approach the witness. You stay at your table unless you're going to bring an exhibit to them, etc. So, but you know, right off the bat, a little unrealistic. Also, I'll just note that this is a, a famous defendant in this episode. Um, mm -hmm. A little rare, also rare. Okay. <laughs> Let's start again. <laughs> okay. Ready? Go. This is great how he's, the prosecutor's like egging him on, trying to get him to confess. Mm -hmm. Also, it doesn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's, let's stop here a second. Okay. <laughs> so, so the prosecutor here is kind of trying to play along. Hey, I know how it is. And then, and then the defendant just starts incriminating himself and, and, the first thing I'll say is that most criminal defendants do not take the stand. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's pretty rare, and there's good reasons for that, because you can be asked about things you couldn't be asked about otherwise. <laughs> um, you know, you they might bring up your prior convictions to impeach you. You might open the door to something, as they say in this episode, he opened the door. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you say the wrong thing, and all of a sudden the prosecutor gets to ask things they wouldn't have been able to. So, um, okay, let's, let's start it again. I 
I love how the defendant just starts uh, making himself look really bad here. <laughs> <laughs> like he can't even pretend. <laughs> and he's had to show who he is, right? I mean, I could be me. <laughs> if I'm being judged by this jury here. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just notice the lawyers here, they object, but they don't see why they're objecting. That's not how it works either. Uh, you know, I mean, I don't know what to say here. You have to state a reason for the objection. Objection relevance, objection goes beyond the scope, something. You don't just object. <laughs> yeah, just object when you don't like something that's said. <laughs> objection, that hurts my case. That's not, that's not an objection, right? Uh, I feel like that's how so, I argue with people, but that's not how it happens in a, in a court proceeding. No, no, not at all. You have to state the, the reason for the objection. And, you know, then the other attorney will respond, you know, maybe an exception to that objection and then the judge rules. It's very kind of orderly and, um, uh, well, dry, frankly. <laughs> so well paced, right? That it's like this, in the show, it's like this volley back and forth, like very quickly. Yeah, you just stand up and say, object, and the judge is like sustained or whatever. Like, no, you know, I'm like, what, what happened? What just happened? Uh, that's not how it works. And, and this defendant, you know, First of all, you'll notice the courtroom was packed, right? But that's not gonna happen in most cases. Um, the defendant was famous and he gets up there and just starts clearly indicating his woman-hating ways and uh, just kind of makes himself very unsympathetic to the jury and almost incriminates himself there. So that's gonna be pretty rare too. Um, from a prosecutor's standpoint, sure they'd love to have that Perry Mason moment, but it doesn't tend to happen that way. It seems like any criminal defense attorney worth his salt, I'm assuming his defense attorney was very expensive, wouldn't even consider putting him on the stand to testify because I mean, he was dislikable, right? The, yes, they would advise against it. And in fact, I think our next clip's gonna get into that issue. So do we wanna <laughs> move on to the next clip? Yeah, let's do that. This episode is uh, a woman that's been accused of bombing an abortion clinic. And and, um, well, let's just start the, the episode and you'll see look, the crazy thing that happens right off the bat here. Okay. It's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> it gets better. Okay, let's just stop here. Okay, so as, as I said, defense attorneys will often advise their clients not to take the stand. And I mean, it wouldn't be completely uncommon for a client not to listen to their attorney's advice. That, that's not crazy. But the defense attorney would definitely not announce in front of the jury, <laughs> your honor, at this time, my client's gonna take the stand against my advice. That, that they might ask for, a moment out of the jurors the jury's hearing for that but that's so that's so wrong in so many ways to just announce to the jury hey i've told my client not to testify but she's going to testify anyway and then the judge makes it worse by going and saying uh you know you know you're gonna be subject to cross-examination and you know but i won't stop you I, all that would happen outside the jurors hearing mm -hmm. uh this counsel would probably ask to approach the bench both attorneys would approach the bench and they'd say, your honor, I need to put something on the record outside of the jury's presence. They'd excuse the jury. Then they'd have that whole little back and forth about, uh, the defense attorney would want to put it on the record that they advised against it, out, but that would not be with the jury present. And the reason they do that is for appeal uh, and, and just for the attorney's own um, benefit to show that they were exercising their duty properly if they were accused of malpractice or anything like that. So right. yeah get on the record but you would not do all this drama in front of the jury this is just crazy yeah that it's very like procedural i think in real life and then in this it's just happening like everybody's just flying by the seat of their pants i mean that would have been boring what i just described would have been like a 20 minute hearing right like you can't do that in a tv show right so they just they just cream everything in and make it all be just flying by past you you know at light speed um yeah when i observe trials too what you said about juries leaving like, I was very surprised by like the standing up, sitting down, leaving, coming back. <laughs> it just, Were you, did you, did you do jury duty? Uh, uh, I had observed a trial. You observed kind of, it. Like yours. Okay. Um, you know, we can't ever get picked for jury duty. 
No, I've never been on a jury, sadly. No. I will be because I either. as soon as we say what we do, we're out. Yeah, I, I mean, no one wants a lawyer on the jury, that's for sure. And, and nor do they want a professor. No. <laughs> well, it's weird because as soon as I say criminology professor, I don't know if like what they think, right? That either I'm, I'm too smart or that I know too much. Or that Actually, they don't, they don't want any academics in general. Uh, I, usually they won't pick academics of any sort, no matter which, what discipline you're in for a jury. And they definitely won't pick lawyers. So I'm, I'm out for sure. Uh, uh, vicariously through other people. Yes, yes. So this is this is interesting. Um, you know, let let's play it and see what happens next. Let's start okay. now. So suspenseful. So she's going to take the stand. This is the person accused of bombing the clinic. The hand over her heart thing is interesting. Yeah, and especially the placement there. Like, yeah. you know, it's kind of a her whole entire upper chest. <laughs> Here's the shocked gasp in the courtroom. Okay, let's stop here a second. So we just had defense counsel ask their first question and defendant immediately confess their guilt. That's pretty rare. I'm, I'm, I think it's safe to say that's extremely rare. Mm -hmm. uh, not only did the defendant, uh, you know, insist on taking the stand against advice, but her strategy was apparently to immediately confess. <laughs> so that's not usually a good strategy. Ill-advised. Uh, <laughs> Ill-advised. Uh, and I think now she's going to launch into a, a kind of a speech about why it was justified, um, okay. not legally, but morally. So let, let's start again. OK. How dare you object? That's great. <laughs> Do. <laughs> I love how she's talking to the jury here. That, that just, she's like making a speech. This doesn't happen either. Yeah, you have to answer the questions asked. You don't get to just make a speech when you're the <laughs> It's like monologue <laughs> in the courtroom. Yeah, exactly. Oh, I love this. This is great. Here comes Stone. <laughs> <laughs> Watch the look on her face here. And the music. Oh, so dramatic. So dramatic. <laughs> My gosh. Oh, it's great. It's classic Law and Order moment. Uh, I thought it was interesting when they said she made the argument about she's been being judged by God. And he said his objection was this trial is taking place on the temporal plane. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's a, that's a unique creative objection, but also not an objection. Like it has to be <laughs> violating a rule, right? A, a objection has to be like um, not answering the question. That, that could have been the objection there, right? Like, so yeah, you're not allowed to just say whatever you want. You have to give the answers to the questions that were asked here. <laughs> What's even better here is that the judge, if you noticed a second ago, uh, the judge actually tried to regain control of the courtroom, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and then the prosecutor ignored that and said, I just have a question. Okay, that, that's not how it works either. Defense counsel wasn't even done questioning her. He didn't say, I'm done. And the judge is trying to have her removed and the prosecutor just says, oh, wait, I've got one question. Leading to the- then he gets up and runs towards the box. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's like utter chaos at this point. Uh, th this is crazy. I mean, frankly, I think several people would have been held in contempt by this point. Uh, you know? <laughs> so in your experience as a prosecutor, I do have to ask, have you ever seen like where a, where a judge loses control and starts banging the gavel and yells at everyone? Because that's really what we want to see. Ne never, never. I never saw that. <laughs> um, I, I, I did not see any judge losing control. Um, I never saw anybody thrown out of a courtroom. Um, never once were any of the courtrooms where I was trying a case packed, where there was a lot of seat left. Uh, usually it was nothing but empty seats. Uh, that's, that's just the reality of what being a prosecutor is like in a typical case. Uh, unfortunately, most people do not take advantage of their right to go observe trials. Anyone can go observe a trial. My students are always shocked when I tell them to go observe court and proceedings. And they're like, oh, well, how, 
you know, what do I do? Or I didn't know I could do that. Or do I have to get permission? I'm like, no, the constitution awesome. gives the right to a public trial. You can walk into the courthouse any day of the week and go in. And some of my students tell me that they plan to go watch more trials in the future now that they've had that experience. Mm -hmm. It's kind of open their eyes, but no, very few people want to go watch trials. Although I'll tell you this, I did watch them while I was waiting on my bar results before I became an attorney. I had not much else to do at the time. And so I watched some trials and every single time the judge and the attorneys would ask like, who are you? Why are you here? Because they always think you're like a witness or something, uh, somebody that shouldn't be in there. And um, they were always shocked that I was like, oh, I'm just want to, you know, learn some stuff. And just watch. here to hang it out. <laughs> just here to, you know, just here to observe. Uh, I was always the only person in the courtroom doing that. Um, well, now that you said they're so boring, I don't want to go either. <laughs> it's like, why would we go? I mean, I'll tell you, actually, I find the most interesting part of trials when I was a lawyer was jury selection. Mm -hmm. It's the part, that was the most strategic part and the most interesting part um, was trying to ask questions and figure out people's biases and mm -hmm. who would be a juror. Um, that, that part is actually pretty interesting. Uh, it's harder mm -hmm. to that because the juror the potential jurors are sitting in the galley where the audience would normally be right so yeah. uh, technically you're allowed to go observe that mm -hmm. a lot of judges will kind of try to keep you from doing it just because of space considerations mm -hmm. but constitutionally you should be able to observe that as well maybe we'll have to do another episode another recording when we watch bull have you seen that i have not seen bull oh well, it's like the high end the outraged selection yeah Oh, okay. Well, that's interesting. Like sample juries and attitude and heart rate stuff. Oh, it's interesting. And oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> like the jury consultant thing. Mm -hmm. I'll say that in your typical criminal trial, there are zero resources devoted to that kind of thing. The attorneys do it in a very non-scientific kind of common sense and instinct way. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, it's kind of more an art than a science. Uh, yeah. Yeah, sure. If you had tons of money, maybe you could hire some jury consultants, and some people do that. But that'd be more typical with either very famous defendants, say O.J. Simpson kind of case, or in civil litigation where there's a lot of money at stake and you've got corporate clients. Oh, fair enough. That's interesting. Well, thanks, yeah. Brenda. This was awesome. Yeah, this is great. I really I, appreciate this. Even though you're bursting everyone's bubble, we're not going to be really mad at you about it. <laughs> Oh, that's good. That's good. Well, you know, Law and Order is a, I'd say a guilty pleasure. I do enjoy watching some Law and Order, even though it's always totally inaccurate. <laughs> and I only wish this was what my days in the courtroom looked like, frankly. It'd be so exciting. Yeah, we're going to have another guest later this, this I guess, season um, talking about the, the order part of it, I guess, in the beginning um, with the police procedural things. But this has been really interesting. So thanks so much. Sure. Thanks for having me.